First of all, I just wanted to commend Des and Cheryl because you can tell a lot about a family when you meet the parents. And you can tell a lot about the kids when you meet the parents, right? And, um, and so what I was thinking and, and just meditating on as we were worshiping Jesus, and throughout this weekend, this is, is something I sense for the whole network, but I, I want to give it to you because I really believe that about your pastors. And I know that about you having been here now a little bit too. But we're in a season of digging wells. It's been said a lot, actually, this weekend, and I was really excited to hear that. And I'm really fascinated about the life of Isaac. And one of the things that it says about him is when, when the servant came to bring him his wife, it said he had been visiting at Ber Laharoi, which was the well that the wellspring that Hagar had gone to. And he was visiting there. And then when he buried his father with Ishmael, his brother, it says he lived at Ber Laharoi. Ber Laharoi means the well of the one who lives and who sees me. And you too have lived by the well of the one who lives and sees you. And because you stayed there, and because you, you've been there, and you've taken that nourishment, and you've drank deeply, and you didn't just visit, you lived. Your church family, and I see that and I sense that, but you're in such a beautiful season of the surrounding areas, but also who you are. You're digging in territories. God's going to um, speak the promises of, of the Abraham, right? You're going to redig those wells. And then there's, there's, um, there's been times, of course, of resistance, and you've been faithful to stand. And then you come into Rehoboam, a spacious place where you can dig wells to your heart's content because the contending, right? It's a season of freedom. It's a season of digging. And the Lord would have and encourage all of you to dig and to live by the well, to live out of that place, and then to dig the wells of relationships, to dig the wells of prayer, because there's breakthrough and there's plenty of water. There's plenty of water. We live in a dry country. We're living in a dry season where there is a famine for the Word of God. There's a famine for the presence of God. So I just want to encourage you, all the things we've been singing, being close to Jesus, that's living by the well of the one who lives and who sees me and we know him and we know him and out of that place, that's where we can give water. That's where we can give refreshing. Don't move away from the well, live there. Live there. And I bless this house, Father. I bless this beautiful house, this beautiful body of believers, Father, with your continued presence. Father, they've been faithful. They've been faithful. Father Cheryl and Des and the team, they've been faithful, God, to not give up. They could have. They could have become embittered. They could have become discouraged, and they didn't. And Father, we're in a day, Lord, when those that persevere, God, they will see the harvest. They will see fruitfulness. So, Lord, we rejoice that we're in this season of Rehoboam, Lord, Rehoboth, Lord, where there's freedom and a spacious place. And God, I bless this house with spacious places and lots of well digging, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was a little concerned there. All right. Yeah, well, I love you too. Yeah. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> yeah, love you too, bro. <laughs> are we getting off track yet? <laughs> yeah, well, it's good to be home. So three weeks away and, and back this week and right into our uh, LifeLinks Prairie Regional uh, prayer summit and wow what a great weekend we've had and I know some of you were there some of you weren't you you missed some good things if you weren't but uh, hey we understand but this weekend just what a blessing to have uh, Ian and Val Bird with us there are life links uh, network apostolic leaders and uh, Ian leads a team uh, an apostolic team with uh, four other guys from around North America uh, that give direction to our, our whole network. And this week, we were here praying with the prairies in mind. Saskatchewan, Manitoba, our representatives from Alberta here. And uh, what a great time we had. And so Ian is here to share with us this morning. Val, you met her already. She came up and gave that encouraging word to us here today. But we want to welcome them here. And we want to release Ian to, to come and share with us this morning. But before we do that, I want to draw 
special note to this book. Ian is not only a really a good speaker and a really good looking guy, but he's an author as well. And he has written this book, Life is a High Way. <laughs> And he's asked me graciously to narrate it for him. <laughs> no, sorry, he didn't do that. I'm <laughs> I could add some really good inflections. But uh, this book is available online on Amazon. Really great book. I know some of you here have it already. I've talked to people in our congregation who've read it. If you haven't, check it out and uh, you'll be blessed by it. But I'm going to call Ian to come up right now. Uh, Val too, I'm not sure what you guys have planned. Say hi or, or not. Uh, okay, Val said hi. So, Ian, <laughs> bless you, brother. Thank you so much, Des. Bless you. I, we really enjoyed hanging with Des and Cheryl. And, uh, you know, Des and I are both former youth pastors. And when we get together, sometimes we revert to being former youth pastors. Nothing against youth pastors. Love them. Just the mindset shifts a little bit, I feel like, but we love, the, we love these guys. We have a few laughs. and Greetings from Lifelinks. We did have a great time yesterday um, at the prayer summit, and uh, it's exciting. You guys are a vital part of our network. I just want you to know that. You are an important part, and I believe that where you're situated here in Saskatchewan, you have influence around you that I believe is going to increase, and that God has his eye on you, and he's pleased with you. It was so awesome today to see all the team in the prayer room. It, it really touched my heart just to see that, to see the culture of prayer and seeking God. You can't go wrong with that. You know, keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep looking to him. He can do above and beyond all that you can ask or imagine, and he will. So anyway, it's exciting to be here. So how many people know this song? Well, we're moving on up to the east side, to a deluxe apartment in the sky. We're moving on up to the east side. We finally got a piece of the pie, and I'll stop right there. Yeah! Anybody remember that song? People my age, roughly, right? Like, younger generation, I have no idea what he's doing right now. That is from a show called The Jeffersons. It was a really kind of groundbreaking show because it was about this black family and they lived in, I think, in Harlem in New York. And then it was George and Louise or Wheezy. Wheezy. Anyway, they, they moved from Harlem. They had a dry cleaning business and uh, it did so well that they got to move to the east side of Manhattan in a big apartment. You know, so they kind of hit the big time. That's what the song is all about. But it's interesting when you watch that. I watched it recently because, of course, preparing for this. And uh, you see the, the start of the show where they sing that. And you can see Louise, she's sitting in a, like a taxi being driven to the new house and she's crying, right? You can see the tears in her eyes. And you're thinking, well, why would Louise be crying? Because she's like, has her dream. She's leaving Harlem. She's going to the east side. She's got a beautiful new place. Why would she be crying? Well, she's crying because it's called change, Right? Yeah, it's a good move. It's positive, and in the end, she's going to enjoy it, but she has to leave behind her old life, right? So even good change can be painful. Anybody ever, ever been there where you had a good thing happen, and God was taking you to another level, but you were still kind of sad because you liked the old thing, right? It's hard. You can't kind of keep a hold of that and then, you know, reach for this, and that's kind of reality, and that's kind of the point in our Christian lives. And I want to talk to you today, so I called it Moving On Up, because, you know, I believe God is leveling up all of us. That's the thing I continue to sense. It's like, Ian, next level, next level. In fact, listen, if you're a believer, you should always want to go to the next level. You know, I've said this before, but it's something I really feel. There's nothing worse in the world than a bored Christian. Seriously, they create trouble. Bored Christians... You know, I, I love serving Jesus. I'm saved. I don't, you don't have to worry about my sins. I'm going to heaven. But I'm bored. I'm not doing anything. I'm not engaged. They're, they're the ones that get, you know, critical and negative and sour. And they're the ones that sometimes just walk away because they're not served. We were never meant to be bored. We were meant to be on the edge all the time. 
We were meant to be listening to the Father all the time and responding every day. And so, so often I own my own life, I go on autopilot, right? I just, you know, get into what I'm doing and I got routine and I like that. And sometimes I think God comes to me and he's, you know, trying to talk to me and stir me to do something and I'm not really paying attention. I'm into my routine. God says, not enough for routine. I want to break you out of that into a place, a living relationship where you're listening to me and watching me every day. And I want to share you a story in the Bible here. This, this passage I'm going to read, I think, is the most redundant passage in the whole Bible. When I read it to you, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to hear that. I'm going to read it. When you listen to it, you're going to think, you know, they probably could have said that in two sentences. Why did they say this and take all this space? Well, I think there's a reason why God wanted it that way. It's in Numbers chapter 9, verse 15 it starts. Now, let me give you a little bit of background. So the Israelites, they live in Egypt. They've been living in Egypt as slaves. Moses comes. Moses, you know, was sent as a deliverer. He confronts Pharaoh. Remember all the ten plagues? I mean, it's quite a story. And got, finally, they're released to go. Uh, they leave. He splits the Red Sea, God does. They go through. And now they're on trajectory to get to the promised land. Now, now they're going to head to... Uh, you know, Canaan land. They're going to go to the promised land. But in between going to the promised land, God has them establish a tabernacle. I've just been going through this in my yearly Bible reading, and uh, it's very tedious reading some of that. You know, the ram skins dyed red and the acacia poles. And I mean, it's detailed. If you don't think God's not detailed, read that. You're like, God, you really care how things are done. And so reading through, so they, God developed that whole thing uh, they, they, they built a tabernacle. They had the Ark of the Covenant in it. They learned where to camp around the tabernacle, all of that stuff. Fantastic, right? So they, they're at that point. And then here's what it's going to talk about. Here's what it's sharing about them as a people and how God deals with them. Well, watch this. It says, on the day the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony was set up, the cloud covered it. So there was this cloud which represented the presence of God. It was a, pillar, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And it was over the tabernacle. Okay, can you picture this? You got to think about this for a minute. It was the tangible presence of God. So wherever they were camped around the tabernacle, they could look up and they could see the cloud and they knew that was God's presence. Isn't that wild? And at night, it would be like, like, you know, I wonder if it was really bright, like, hey, put the shades on the tent. I can't sleep tonight. I don't know, because it would have been really bright over there, but it was God's presence. And so here's what it says about it. It says, on the day of the tabernacle, the tent of testimony was set up. The cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked like fire. So at night, that is how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night it looked like fire. Verse 17 Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Wherever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. Why don't you say this with me? Why don't you say, whenever and wherever? Can you say that? Okay, one more time, 9 o'clock service. We're going to do this, all right? Whenever and wherever. Thank you. These are two words to remember. Whenever and wherever. Because that is how they were to live. Whenever the cloud lifted... And wherever it went, that's where they were supposed to go. At the Lord's command, let's continue to read here. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out. And at his command, they encamped. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. When the cloud remained over the tabernacle a long time, the Israelites obeyed the Lord's order and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was over the tabernacle only a few days. At the Lord's command, they would encamp. And then at the Lord's command, they would set out. Sometimes the cloud stayed only from evening till morning, one day. And when it lifted in the morning, they set out, whether by day or by night. Wow, sometimes they set out at night. Think of that, right? Seems a little challenging. 3 a.m., we got to go. Wow, that wouldn't be exciting, would it? Whether by day or by night, whenever the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days or a month or a year. Do you see how redundant this is? Wow. Two days, a month, or a year, the Israelites would remain in camp and not set out. But when it lifted, they would set out. Verse 23 seems to sum it all up. At the Lord's command, they encamped. At the Lord's command, they set out. They obeyed the Lord's order in accordance with his command through Moses. Whew. Do you see that? You see what I'm talking about? Like, wow, like that's really like, hey, let's just 
use this multiple ways to remind you that when the cloud was there, they were there. When the cloud moved, they moved, and so forth. Now, why would this passage stress that so much? Why? See, everything in the Old Testament is used as an example for us. There's a reason why God did that. You know why that, I believe that passage is like that? Because God wants to show us in that passage that that's the way our life is to be. See, he wants us to follow the cloud of the Holy Spirit, the cloud of his presence in our life. We are meant to be camped around the presence of God. We are meant to be camped in proximity to where he lives. Now, he lives in us, and he wants us to be in a place where we're communing with him. We're close to the cloud. We're close to his presence. We're hearing him, and then we're responding to him. Now, if you think about it, there was a lot of different things going on here, right? A lot of time periods. Like, so it says they, sometimes they were there up to a year. I don't know about you, but that sounds nice. You, know, you with families? Now, let's, let's take ourselves and put ourselves into the position. Because sometimes we read that and go, oh, yeah, okay. Have another coffee. Wow. But when we think about it, if you really think about what these people went through, think about this. So somebody had to be watching the cloud all the time all the time, because they never knew when it was going to leave. They never knew. So somebody must have been on guard watching the cloud, which could have been tedious, but they, you know, make sure it didn't move. And when it moved, as soon as it moved, I'm sure there was a blast on the horn, like, the cloud's moving, guys, we got to go. And, it, and no matter what they were doing, they had to move. The cloud was moving. I wouldn't want to be left behind in the desert, right? They got to get going. So for a year, maybe not so bad. Think about the year. Be very comfortable. They bring in the tabernacle. They set it all up. They, they, you know, have all, if you read, all the tribes had their places around the tabernacle. And so they'd set up camp. They'd have to pitch their tents. You know, they'd get into routine. You know, I don't know what they slept on, but it would all be nice there. They'd figure out where they're all going to go to the toilet. All those important things would be figured out, right? For a year, you know. We all like routine, a year. Hey, it's not too bad. I wonder when the cloud's going to lift again. I don't know. It's been about a year. Maybe. Maybe soon. And then the, the cloud would suddenly move one day, and they'd be like, okay, it's been about a year. That makes sense. Hey, guys, come on. Let's go. I wonder where we're going to go next. And they'd, you know, they'd pack everything up. And, you know, the tabernacle, if you look at the tabernacle, the amount of work involved, those Levites, they'd be putting everything together. I mean, it would... It was big, and then they, you know, on their shoulders, they're walking out, the ark's there, and they'd move out. And then they'd, oh, here's the next spot. Well, this is a nice spot. I wonder if we'll be here another year. This would be a nice spot to be for a year, wouldn't it? It'd be great. So they camp. Now, if you read how many different time periods they were there, one says from morning to evening, 24 hours. So let's think about that for a minute, right? You know, hey, guys. We were a year in that other spot. Look at this. This is great. I can hardly wait to live here for a year. Okay, come on. Come on, kids. We're going to set the tent up. Can you imagine parents? Think about this. Setting the tent up and getting your bed rolls out, right? And, uh, you know, the, the guys at the tabernacle, Levites, are working hard. They're, they're getting all the, the you know, the, the, the bronze altar out and everything else. They're setting it all up, anticipating being in this spot. Get the kids down. Mom and dad are standing at the door of the tent, sipping some Israelite coffee. I don't know what they're having, but they're having something, you know, thinking about how busy a day it's been. All of a sudden, <laughs> cloud starts moving. I wonder if there's a few Jewish swear words. Seriously. It's like, oh my goodness, the kids, you know, just laid down. It's be kids, kids, we got to go. The clouds, are, what? Yeah, we got to go now. Guys, the tabernacle just finished. Oh boy. Okay, here we go. Right? I never, you know, when I studied this, I really thought through that. I thought that would be inconvenient. God, what are you doing? I thought we'd be here a year. Now we're moving right away. What was God doing? He's making sure they stayed attentive. He was making sure they knew listen, I'm the Lord. You don't know the times or seasons. The only thing, listen, you need to understand this. The only thing you and I can control is our focus on God. That's it. 
We want to control everything. If you're like me, you want to control everything. I want to make sure everything works out. I want to make sure I think I, I'm controlling. I am. I've had to learn not to control. Because you know what? I'm not in control. Here, here's something to realize. The more you let God be in control, the more freedom you have. The more you let God be in control, the more freedom you have. The more you will not be so consternated when things don't go well. The more you will be able to be at peace and rest and trust him that he's going to provide for you. Control is not your friend because you give control. That's what Lord means. He's the master. He's in control. He's the Lord. Lordship is vital for our lives. Some people say, Jesus, you're my Lord, but he's not really. Because you know what? They determine when they move. They determine what they do. They're not looking for the cloud. This is really something we need to understand. So part and parcel with saying, Jesus, you're my Lord, is Jesus, I'm going to be looking at the cloud. I want to know, Father, where your presence is. I want to know where your Holy Spirit's leading. And I will move when you move. But see, our tendency is to camp. It really is. We like camping, right? And so... If you think about it, one of the stories I like is in Mark chapter 9. And this is, this is the Mount of Transfiguration. So uh, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John with him, and they go up on a high mountain. And, I, you know, Peter, James, and John didn't know what was going to happen. You know, when you read Scripture, we all know what's going to happen, right? It's pretty convenient for us. Why were those Israelites so unbelieving? Look what God did. Well, hey, they didn't know, Right? You don't know how God's going to come through. Like, give them a bit of room here, right? They were trying to walk it out in real time. And so Peter, James, and John, hey, guys, let's go up this mountain. Okay, Jesus, I don't know what we're going to do up there. Maybe we're just going to look around over the area. They go up, and what happens is uh, Jesus is transfigured. His clothes become dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. Wow, they must be like radiating. Tide, eat your heart out, right? That's what it's saying. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Now, Elijah and Moses, they represent the law, Moses, and the prophets. Elijah, law and the prophets. Why are they talking to Jesus? Because what's going to happen on the cross and what Jesus is going to do is going to create a new covenant. Do you understand? So things are changing. So you've got the law and the prophets represented, and they're talking to Jesus And Peter's sitting there watching all this. He's thinking, this is incredible. Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. It says he didn't know what to say. They were so frightened. Wouldn't you be? But Peter's still thinking. You know, Peter, he's still like, wow, I see an opportunity here. We can put up three booths. We could have souvenir coins. We could have people coming up. I don't know. He's just thinking, this could be amazing. I mean, we got to remember this day forever. This is phenomenal. This is the apex. (laughs) A cloud appears, and a voice comes from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And then suddenly, when this all happens, which is amazing, they look around, just Jesus standing there. Crickets chirping. It's quiet, right? Peter was so excited that he thought, well, we should do this. You know what Jesus says? Uh, let's go back down, right? Jesus is saying, no, no, we're not camping here, Peter. You don't even know. This isn't even it. That was pretty fantastic, but what's going to happen next is even greater. So don't start camping here. I want to remember when Jesus and Moses and Elijah, let's just think of those days, right? Jesus is saying, no, it's not even close to what I want for you. You know, you think about it, we all camp in our lives at times, don't we? Here's how we do that. When we pine for the former days when God moved, right? Oh, I remember 1994 on the floor in 94, right? I wish that would happen again and I'd be twitching like a cockroach on the floor in Toronto, right? That was me, actually. I did that. Anyway, but you know what I'm saying? Some of you are going, I don't even know what he's talking about. But anyway, power of God moving, impacting people. God says, it's not 1994. It's 2024, 30 years later. I have another plan now. Don't camp there. Oh, let's try to relive that and make that happen. No, no, no. God's moved on. That was great. There was a reason. God's moved on. Or sometimes we're hesitant to embrace new experiences. Here are the worst words you can hear in a church. 
Here they are. You ready? Don't ever say these words. We've never done it this way before. You ever done that? Something happened. We've never done it that way before. Famous last words of a group of believers. We've never done it that way before. Listen, God is into change. He's into growth. He's into movement. We have to be changing. We have to be moving. This, this even implies us of an older generation. You know, when I was of the younger generation, I know I look incredibly young, but when I was of the younger generation, under 30, <laughs> yeah, and actually had dark hair, um, I, I was like part of the, the young generation. I remember thinking... You know, I remember thinking that we wanted to do things a new way and all that. Well, now I'm approaching 60, and then I realize, hey, wait a minute. You could be the older generation now that's kind of like, hey, I don't know if I like that. Yeah, I don't think that's right. No, we need to adjust. God is doing fresh new things. Lamentations 3 says this, verse 22, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. You think about the fact that they had fresh manna to pick up every day. They got tired of it, but it was God's provision. New every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. Think about those Israelites. God had them dependent in multiple ways. Number one, they had to watch the cloud. They wanted his protection and they wanted to be in his presence. They had to move with him. He wasn't going to adjust to their plans. Number two, they had to go every morning and get the manna he provided for the day, and they couldn't even store it till tomorrow. Keep it till tomorrow, it turns into a maggot-infested mass, right? You have to go out every day and get the fresh manna. Look how dependent they were. He was teaching them, I'm your source. Listen, God wants to teach you the same thing. Teach me the same thing. You need him every day. You need a fresh word every day. It's a, it's a walking with him. Now, the exciting thing is when we look to where the cloud is going, God has good things for us. Now, sometimes the cloud will lead us to a place that doesn't seem better. Anybody ever been there? God leads you to go and do something which doesn't at first seem better. I remember in uh, 20, 2009, 2009 uh, I was on the Apostolic team of Lifelinks. I was in a meeting in Regina with some of the other guys. They were talking about church planting. And Mark Hughes was there, Mark Hughes in Winnipeg, if you know who he is. They were, they were talking about, hey, where should we go? Maybe we can leverage Mark's ministry on TV, plant another church. They said, Calgary, we think Calgary. And so then they were talking, well, who, who would go to Calgary? And we had some ideas, and we talked about some of these. said, no, nah, it's not really good, not really the right idea. And then Mark Hughes turned and looked at me and said, Ian, actually, we need you to go to Calgary. It was the moment that changed my life. And... I went home and talked to my wife, and she said, this sounds so awful, it must be God. I'm not joking. That is literally what she said. Now, it sounds terrible to say that, but how many people know sometimes when God talks to you and asks you to do something, it does sound awful. It sounds different than what you'd want. We wrestled for five months with that. Halfway through, we thought, no, we're not supposed to go. We loved our church. We had a great church in the hat. We had, we had city influence. We had lots of stuff going on. So much potential. I had a staff. I mean, it was great. And God's saying, I want you to leave that, and I want you to go to Calgary and start a new church with nothing. That doesn't sound exciting to me. But you know what? Halfway through, we said no. And then God, in his loving way, and we were still open to him, said, no, no, no. I want you to do this. So we did. We packed up the church in 2010, basically packed it up in the sense that we turned it over, and 10 years to the Sunday, boom, we left for Calgary. And, we, and the people that were going to go with us didn't even go with us. We went with nobody <laughs> initially. I tell you, it was discouraging. I thought, Lord, this will either be a great thing or my career's over. That's how I felt. But you know, it's a good place to be because God says, well, you got to look to me. You got to look to the cloud. What am I going to do? And he did. He brought us people and God did it. And to be honest, the cloud moved again last year. And we sense God say, you know what? You need to merge with the other Lifelinks church, and then you be released to go full-time in Lifelinks. And that's what we did. But that, I'll be honest, that was painful again. Had all sorts of mixed emotions. Do you hear what I'm saying? If we want comfort, if we want to just do what feels good to us, we won't follow the cloud, folks. We won't. 
Because sometimes it's uncomfortable. But let me just say this. When you and I obey and follow God's leading, there will be blessing in the end. I would rather be uncomfortable in the will of God than comfortable out of the will of God. I mean that. Because you know what? If you're comfortable outside the will of God, ultimately that will not end well. You will not be blessed and fruitful. And you'll become a bored Christian. And you'll become a problem. I'm sorry. I'm being blunt. But that's what happens. God says, I want you to be fresh. The other way that we sometimes, so we rely on yesterday's anointing and touch from God. And God says, Ephesians 5, don't get drunk on wine. Be filled with the Spirit. And that means every day, every day, every day. The other thing we see if we, we, we are not moving with the cloud and when we camped is we have only old testimonies of God moving in our lives. Sometimes that's an ouch for me. I'm like, oh man, my stories are getting old. Huh? Ever been there? You got these great stories, but they're old now. Where are the new ones? Where are the ones from today and yesterday? God, God wants to give you new stories. Daniel 11:32. The people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Sometimes we lose our vision. And it says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. See, here, here's, listen, listen to me on this. This is really important. We talk a lot about vision, eh? You need a vision for your life. Now, here's what the world tells you. You can be whatever you want to be. It's not true, folks. Sorry. I don't believe that for one minute. You can be whatever God wants you to be. Okay? That's the truth. So if you are going to just create your own vision, I want my vision, this is my vision. Fine. Try it. Do your best. Or could your vision be, I'm going to follow the cloud. What's the vision of the Father for me? How is he moving me? What does he want to do? And that vision may lead you into places you don't want to go, but in the end, it's where God exactly needed you to be. Do you understand? I really believe, and we were talking yesterday about this a little bit, that uh, in this day and age, God is looking for people who are mobile and ready to move. God wants to do more in our nation. He wants to do more in your community. But he needs people who are obedient. When we talk about the church, it means you. Sometimes we look at the church as a separate entity from us. Oh, the leaders, they will do this. No, you will do this. It's you together. And God's saying, you will have a part in this. And sometimes we draw lines and say, I will never move. I will never go anywhere else. How do you know that? I love Yorkton with all my heart. I would never leave here. Why would you say that? I, I love Medicine Hat. I love Medicine Hat. I would have gone and bought graves there for Val and I. Not that we were planning to die quickly, but I would have said, hey, we'll die here. We love this place. God said, that's not your final place. Don't get your heart all set in. Don't camp too long because if the cloud moves, you won't move with it. Stay flexible. Stay open. I believe in these days in our network, God's going to call people to go to different places and plant churches. We were talking about that. We were talking about how, you know, are the days gone by where people were willing to do that, uproot their lives, wholesale, do something different? Or is there a new era where God says, I'm actually stirring things so that people will go and move and be, you know, because we're never meant to be a holding container. We're meant to be sending places. Churches are sending places, right? They're equipping places and then sending you into your community and into your destiny. It might be that some of you are sent to go far away. Some of you might be sent to go on a mission field. Some of you might be sent to go to other parts of Canada. Who knows? I, that could never be me. Don't say never. I've learned don't say never, right? Because God has his ways. I don't, I'm not saying he's going to do it, but we need to be willing. So how do we move on up? Well, the first thing is we get rid of old junk. We clean up for the move. I don't know if you're like me, but when I move, I find out how much garbage I have, how much stuff I've accumulated. <laughs> Moving is the great opportunity to get rid of things. Why do I have this? I think there's something living down there. You know, like... God says, clean up, be nimble, be light, move on. So we got to get rid of the old junk. Well, what's some of that? Old mindsets, lies, negative attitudes. Ephesians 4 says this, 29 to 32. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. 
Do not, verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Wow. Whew. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ has forgiven you. You know, our speech, our mindset, that's the garbage that stops us from moving. Right here, biggest area, unbelief, doubt, lies about ourselves and what we can or can't do. God says, get rid of unwholesome talk. You know, when I, we were youth pastors, um, we used to drive places in vans. We'd have vans of young people, and, you know, it was fun, right? But sometimes that van of young people would get a little carried away and a little off track. Right? Some of the stuff they're talking about isn't so good. And so what we had a little code. And we'd say this when that happened. We'd say, it's almost 4.30. You know why we say it's almost 4.30? Because Ephesians 4.30 says, do not grieve the Spirit of God. <laughs> it's almost grieve time. I think, I think you're getting close. I sense the cloud lifting from the van. Stop talking like that. <laughs> Get rid of bad negative talk aggressively deal with doubts. You know, my wife, went, wife and I went through a period of time where we, um, we wrote down all the lies that God showed us that we believed. We went through some ministry, and we wrote pages. I remember it was just pages of lies, pages like fear, unbelief about what he could do in us and our worth, how we didn't feel... Uh, like God loved us. Like these are lies that we can believe or that we needed to be perfect to please God. And we had pages of them. And then we, we, God gave us wisdom to know what the truth was. And then we put a scripture by them. And then we renounced them and broke agreement. And then for like two months, we went through and read them every day. It took a while. So many lies. We don't even know sometimes. We think everything we believe is truth. But if it doesn't match with the word of God, it's a lie. Part of moving requires us to get rid of that, that old way of thinking. So we need to deal with the things that stop us, the, the sin, the aspects of our life that will stop us from moving. And then we need to prepare for the new thing. 1 Peter 1.13 says, prepare your minds for action. Prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope on the grace to be given you in Christ Jesus to reveal. Prepare your minds for action. Listen, if you're going to move as a church, as individuals, as a people, your mind needs to be renewed. The question to ask God is, where does my mind need to be renewed? If I'm to move to the next level, if I'm to move on up, what do I need to see renewed in my life? Where am I believing lies? God wants to prepare me for action. And then thirdly, we need to forget the past and focus on the future. Isaiah 43 says this in verse 18. Well, actually, let's read it real quick here. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters. He who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Isn't that an amazing part of what happened to Israel? That's when the Lord wiped out the Egyptians. I mean, wouldn't that be worth remembering? That's exciting. Look at that. That's great. So what does God say? Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. He's not even saying it about negative things. He's saying, you know, when I buried the Egyptians in the water and I took you by supernatural power out of Egypt, forget all that. I'm going to do even more. Really? Yeah. If you believe me. Listen, Prairie Harvest, God has done some great things in your life, in your church. You've got this building. You're, you now have two services. God is moving. You're praying. He has more for you. Listen, he has more for you. You know what he says? Forget the past. Like, don't dwell on what I did in the past. I mean, yes, be, rejoice, but don't just live there. And don't just say, well, we got to do it exactly this way. He's saying, hey, listen, Prairie Harvest, the cloud is going to continue to move for you. I'm going to continue to open new doors. I'm going to continue to highlight things to you as individuals. I'm going to continue to move in a fresh way. And I need you to keep your eyes on the cloud. Don't get rooted and grounded in what I have done or what I am doing now. I need you to be fresh because what I'm about to do in your lives and in this place is beyond what you've seen before. But it will only happen if you are obedient to me and you are willing to let me guide you every day. Do you hear me? I sense this strongly for you. And you've been preparing yourself for this because you've been posturing yourself in prayer and listening to the Father. And he's pleased. 
And he looks down on this church and on your beautiful leaders, and he says, I have more. More and abundantly more than you even think. But it's up to you to look to me and trust me and be willing to adjust as I move. If you're willing, I will do this great thing among you. Believe that strongly for you today. Because verse 19 says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Last scripture. Philippians 3 says this. This is Paul. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. You know what? If the Apostle Paul says one thing he does, I think it would be worth listening to. What's the one thing Paul does? Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Here's what he's saying, and this applies to any part of our life. I can't strain and grab a hold of what God has for me here if I'm going to hold on here. See, sometimes we want both. Can I just, like, hold on here, God, and then, you know, kind of, like, you know, strain my hamstring by, by pushing forward into what you have here? Can I just do that? And God says, no, you've got to let go. And this in-between part is the tough part. Do you hear what I'm saying? Letting go. But what's next? God knows, and I'm going to reach out for it. When we left Medicine Hat, we couldn't hold on to that church. We had to let go and strain forward. Some of you are going to have to do that in bigger ways than you realize. Because God's going to say to you, I want to do this in your life. You're like, God, no, but I like this. Yeah. Can you let that go? Yeah. Can you follow the cloud? Okay, God, we will. Because I'm going to do something new. Would you stand with me today? I want to pray with you. I sense something on this for you guys. I hope you sense that. It's not just me with a message. I believe it's the Holy Spirit. Would you close your eyes with me? Because I think God wants all of us to respond personally to this. And it's just a willingness of heart to do whatever he calls us to do. I want to ask you a question. Can you just consider for a minute, what is God saying to you today? It's not what I've said. It's what is he saying? Where are you holding on to the past? Where are you unwilling to follow the cloud? Where are you believing some things you shouldn't believe? He's not here to condemn you. He loves you. He wants to take you on as a church and individuals into his greater purpose. Let him search you today. He's right here. What's he saying? What's the next step for you? I always encourage people when I preach, just take the next step now. What is it? What is it? Now, when you have it, would you do me a favor and lift your hand up? Just put it up because I'm going to agree in prayer with you. Yeah, thank you. When you have it, just put your hand up. Just a sign of, Lord, I surrender today. Yeah, I see your hands. I want to pray for you right now. Father in heaven, we come to you. And we thank you that we're called to follow the cloud. We thank you that you say, be close to my presence. Listen to me, and I will lead you and do things that you've never thought of. And right now, you know why these hands are up. You know what you're saying to these people. Lord, I pray for those that have to deal with lies, maybe some unforgiveness and offense towards others that is holding them back. I pray this morning you'd help them deal with that. I pray for those who have been living in fear. And you're saying, I don't want you to be afraid anymore. Trust me and surrender afresh to me and I will do great and wonderful things in your life. Whatever it is, God, we agree with you today. And I agree with them that, God, you would move. And I bless them. I pray, God, for this house. I pray for Des and Cheryl and their, their team. You give them wisdom as they follow the cloud. This is a house that follows the cloud. This is a a house that covets the presence of God. Hmm. And so, Lord, I thank you that as they do that, they will not miss one step of what you have. 
But Lord, may all their hearts be willing because their best days are still coming and a harvest is coming like they've not seen. And you are posturing and positioning them for that. Their name is prophetic. And the truth is it's going to come to pass. So I speak blessing over them right now. We seal this word today. We ask you to continue to work in our lives. In Jesus' name. Now with our head bowed, I want to ask one more question. Anyone here? And you'd say, I don't know Jesus. My step to follow the cloud is to give my life to God so that I start following him. I'm not following him. I'm following my own way. I, I, I came up with my own vision, but you know what? I need his vision, and I need to repent of my sin, and I need him. Anybody here would say, I need Jesus. I, I've never made a commitment. Just slip your hand up. I want to pray for you right now. Anybody at all? Anybody at all? Always got to ask. So, Father, thank you, and we give this time to you. Bless these people as they go into their week. May they follow the cloud. May they sense your love and presence. And we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.